Facebook. Hello, Slumber Made Simple and all you tired mamas out there. It is nice to meet you. Courtney Zen's here. I apologize for being a minute late. I was just finishing up with a client call and uh, that's what happens. I'm a few minutes late and I totally apologize. It's sometimes hard to get, get folks off the phone, but we were chit-chatting a bit about their little ones sleep and how good they're doing, which is great. Uh, so I welcome you. If this is your first time meeting me, hi. Uh, my name's Courtney Zentz. I founded Tiny Transitions about six years ago, and I work to support families all over the place uh, to build healthy sleep habits from birth through, frankly, young adult. I work with all different age children, uh, and so I'm excited for you to be here. So it sounds like, obviously, if you're joining, you have a newborn that is struggling a little bit with sleep, or you're an expecting parent that is going to be having a baby soon, and you want to make sure you're set up for success, you have come to the right place. I am going to share with you more in this next hour than you will have ever gotten uh, from any program, probably any paid program as well, to ensure that your little one has great sleep habits for the rest of their life. So if you're popping in here, if you're watching live, let me know. So hashtag live, hashtag replay, it lets me know when people are catching this so I can make sure in the future that I'm scheduling events that are happening at the right time. So again, hashtag live, hashtag replay, tell me who you are, where you're from, and how old your little one is or when their due date is. That's also gonna be super helpful. So I can make sure that as we're going through here, I'm answering your questions and providing insight and information for you on your newborn and how to get them to be an amazing sleeper for life. So what we're gonna talk about today, the first we're gonna cover newborn sleep needs because they're gonna sleep a lot. And you wanna make sure the sleep is structured in a way that's gonna set them and you up for the most amount of success in a variety of areas. First the most amount of success sleeping overnight, right? But also balancing the adequate amount of intake that a child needs and the fact that a newborn should be eating in the middle of the night, which is pretty common for most parents. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. The next thing we're gonna talk about is swaddling and how to select the swaddle or make sure that the swaddle you're using is the right one for your little one. So there's a lot of different swaddles on the market, a lot of different swaddle transition products and wearable blankets. I love so many of them for so many reasons, and we're gonna dive into exactly what they are and how to know which one's gonna be the right one for your little one. I'm obviously gonna be taking some questions as it comes in, so be sure to pop those in the comments. We're gonna talk about sleep needs and bedtime and making sure all of this great stuff aligns for those first three months of life. Now, for anybody that's watching live out here, Definitely make sure you comment because I'm going to share with you my newborn ebook uh, that's going to set you up for success in the long term. And because I'm nice, anybody that catches this on the replay and lets me know, hashtag replay, I will share a copy with you as well. So the newborn ebook, I spent a lot of time writing. It's probably 60 pages. Um, resources, support, materials, sample schedules, structures, you name it. It is normally a book that I sell um, and it's something that I'm gonna be giving to you today as a thank you just for coming out to participate. You know, I have a conversation a lot with uh, tired parents, with other practitioners, pediatricians, chiropractors and such that I work with. And they say like, why do you give away so much, right? So many people are just holding that information in and trying to get you on a sales call and pitch you on getting support. And the answer is frankly, I'm here to serve, right? Not everybody needs my help. I'm gonna set you up with a lot of information you're gonna implement that information. If it works, great, you've got a baby that sleeps great. You may find that there's a little bit of something else going on that you need help with, and I'm always gonna be here to, to, to help and support you if that time should come. So use this information and everything that I share in my Slumber Made Simple Facebook group to your advantage because it's gonna help you to build a strong foundation. Baby sleep is a skill set, right? It's the one thing that frankly nobody's talked about for a long time. It's a skill that you're building from birth. And by setting a child up with the skill or ability to sleep independently, they're going to have really strong sleep habits for the rest of their life. Gone are the days of sleep regressions. Gone are the days of the anxiety that all of you probably are facing right now around, what is tonight's bedtime gonna look like? Is it gonna take them an hour to fall asleep? Are they gonna be up six times? They're gonna be up at four in the morning? How do I know if this is a habit waking or a hunger waking, right? They're really tired at naps. Their naps suck. I don't know what to do to make them longer. So we're going to chat through all of that. And without further ado, I want to dive right in because I love talking about this stuff. And so we are going to get down to it. 
The first thing that I want to talk about for your newborn is the fact that they are sleeping a lot. The first three months of life are what many refer to as the fourth trimester. Newborns are going to come home and they're going to have those couple days in the hospital where they seem to sleep all the time and they're super cute and quiet. If you're nursing, they latch really well. And then all of a sudden you get home and you go, uh oh, your milk comes in, the latch changes, your breasts are hard. That's a struggle, right? They're crying all the time. You don't know what's going on. That's a struggle. They're trying to nap. You don't know how long they should be awake or how long they should nap or what this looks like. That's a struggle. So we're going to start by breaking down first and foremost, the single most important thing that I can teach you today from a lesson standpoint that you need to pay attention to. I have talked about it for years. Awake windows. I don't care if your baby takes six naps, four naps, five naps, seven naps. I care that the awake window is setting them up for success. Newborns should only be awake 45 to 60 minutes in between sleeping. If your baby is sleeping and they're waking and they're up longer than that, they're likely getting into overtired, which is triggering, triggering typically short naps, generally fuss and protest, probably poor eating, and a little bit of discomfort or agitation, right? Babies getting overtired, floods their brain with adrenaline and cortisol, and they really struggle to settle. We've all had a newborn that's been overtired and you do anything in your power to just get them to sleep, right? So you wanna watch that awake window. For those first eight weeks of life, 45 to 60 minutes, somewhere around eight weeks, you're gonna have the awake window start to lengthen between an hour and probably about an hour and a half. At four months, you're looking at roughly about a two hour awake window, five months, two and a half hours. Six out, at six months, you're looking at roughly about two and a half to three hours. So you can see it kind of gradually is gonna grow as your baby grows. And one of the things that I will make sure to comment on here is gonna be a link to my awake window breakout. And so I pulled it out here to show you what it is. And I'm gonna post the link in the comments here. If, it's, if you're catching this on the replay somewhere else, uh, it's also at my website, tinytransitions.com forward slash tools. Um, and it's called my awake window breakout. Okay, so these are the recommended awake windows based on the age. So it kind of helps you to figure out like what age your baby is and then how much they need to sleep. Okay, so awake windows are the single most important thing you need to pay attention to for a couple reasons. One, you need to make sure your little one's not getting overtired. Overtired causes adrenaline and cortisol, floods their little bodies. They get super strung out. Their body's basically fighting their brain. They can't sleep and they are ready to pass out, but can't. We've all been around toddlers for sure that are overtired. I know I have two myself that sometimes get there despite my day job, because uh, it's the summer and I'm trying not to be a total psychopath uh, sleep specialist all the time. Let them have a little fun, but I do know when they're overtired because you can immediately tell in behavior. With a newborn, you can't. You can generally just tell from tears because that's the only way they can express how they're feeling, okay? Sleep begets sleep. So when you have a day that's a mess, baby that's overtired, naps have not gone well, your nights are typically also a mess. Sleep begets sleep. So for you, the first goal that I wanna encourage you as a new parent to look at is watching and tracking awake windows, okay? So in the newborn book that I'm gonna share with you, you're gonna see a sleep log, okay? This sleep log is gonna allow you to be able to track exactly what's going on in your day so you can start to notice habits, right? Maybe in the morning they can only be awake for 45 minutes, but by the end of the day they can actually do an hour and they're totally fine. And maybe you'll see that if they're awake for an hour, they sleep for an hour and a half. If they're awake for 45 minutes, they only consistently sleep for 20 minutes, right? Meaning there's a little bit of undertired there. So that's where tracking is gonna to start to help you to pay attention to what's going on. So your first goal is gonna be assess your day. I want you to take note of what's happening, mark down all of the naps, what their durations are, and start to assess the total sleep that they're getting in the daytime, okay? When you talk about sleep with newborns, the other side of that is intake, right? You need to make sure that baby is getting the intake that they need, right? So from an intake standpoint, Baby should still, as newborns, be waking. Like, I think a lot of people assume what I do is that you hire me and bring me in and I'm going to teach your baby to sleep through the night. Like, sleep's a skill set. I'm going to educate you as a parent to be informed and empowered. I'm going to teach you when your baby is hungry, they should eat. I'm going to teach you when they're overtired, they need to sleep more, right? And we're going to look at all of this in a holistic picture. This is not about sleep training, right? People always gave me flack when I joked that when my daughter was born, I sleep trained her right away. It wasn't that I was letting her cry it out, which I think is what everybody believes that we do. It was that 
I set her up for success. I watched her awake windows. I fed her every three hours. I made sure that she had good habits where once or twice a day I would put her down awake in the crib. And guess what happens magically every week that she's alive? She's building a skill set of sleep independently. And by the time she's 12 weeks old, she is going 12 hours at night because she knows how and she's getting the right intake in the day. All right. Does that mean that like if they're 12 weeks old and they're not going through the night that something's wrong? No. Babies need to eat 24 to 32 ounces. So that's the perfect segue into the next conversation around food. In a 24 hour period, a baby needs 24 to 32 ounces of milk in the 24 hour period of the day. Okay, breast milk formula, same thing, doesn't matter. Same quantity. They're gonna take the same quantity the day they come home from the hospital as they will at 11 months old. The thing that changes is the size of their stomach and how often that they need to eat in order to feel satisfied, right? A newborn's eating every three hours, probably around the clock. Whereas a six or seven month old is eating regularly every three hours during the day. And in most cases, sleeping through the night, I do have clients where maybe they have supply challenges and they know it. And we talk about that. And I say, you know what? We're gonna keep a feeding in overnight because that's appropriate to make sure baby is fed and is getting the right amount of milk and is growing. And guess what? They sleep through the rest of the night with the exception of those few minutes to feed, right? There's no right or wrong. There's no one size fits all. It's really about making sure that you're providing full feedings to your child every three hours during the day. Now I talk a lot about every three hours and it's not meant to mean that you put a newborn on a strict schedule where they only eat every three hours and if they're hungry, you don't feed them. But what I'm talking about is graze eating actually, because I have a lot of clients that will come to me and say, baby eats every hour and a half. You know, we're kind of baby led. We're, we're going with every time they open their mouth to be upset, I kind of assume they're hungry. And what ends up happening is their total intake in the day is actually less, right? Because they're graze eating. Like I have two toddlers. If I fed them breakfast and then I fed them, you know, some apple slices. And then an hour later they had a couple crackers. And then all of a sudden it's lunchtime and I'm like, okay, peanut butter and jelly served. They're like, we're not hungry. Like, what do you mean you're not hungry? It's lunchtime. Well, they've snacked all morning. So their their brain isn't like, feed me, right? They're kind of like, now cool, I'll take two bites and then I'm going to go play. That's sort of what happens if you're not doing full feedings with kids and you're using essentially like food as the mechanism to calm, right? It's trying to understand like if they're actually hungry, baby should be fed. So don't mistake me. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that, you know, full feedings every three hours tend to do a few things. One, it ensures that your breast is emptied if you're nursing so that from a supply standpoint, it regulates and regulates well, okay? It's also meant to say that when that gas tank is empty, babies are getting that full amount that they need. And by the end of the day, your volume is actually usually a bit more, which also helps supply. If you structure your day so that you're eat, sleep, feed, play, like you've got all these different things that are going on, right? You've got to make sure that you're set up for success so that you ideally want baby to play and then sleep and then wake up and eat because now they're rested and they're hungry, right? So they're going to take a more efficient feed, whether it's from the breast or bottle. They're not going to be tempted to use the breast or bottle as a mechanism to fall asleep, right? If they're feeding right before it's nap time, they're going to start to learn that they're going to feed to sleep, right? Which is a lot of times what most parents are trying to get away from. Now, a trick for that at bedtime, because we want to make sure baby's feeding before sleep, is to feed them actually after like a bath, but before pajamas. So when baby's just in a diaper. That way it encourages a full feed. They're a little bit chilly. They're only in the diaper. They nurse or take the bottle much better and more efficiently. And then you have them upright for a few minutes to burp. Keep them upright while you're reading a book, you get their pajamas on, you do some infant massage, right? And then you're putting them down for the night on a full belly where they've actually taken that nice full feed versus using the breast or bottle as the mechanism to fall asleep for naps or bedtime, okay? So feedings in the day, typical schedule and what that looks like. The newborn ebook that I'm gonna share with you all just for coming in is gonna be something that uh, is going to help you, right? Because it breaks down some sample schedules, but ideally, You know, you want to look at your awake windows and balancing the feedings in between. Sure, there's going to be times where a feeding is going to interrupt the middle of a nap. Does it mean you wake baby in order to feed him? Sometimes, if the baby's been already asleep for like two hours for a nap and it's a feeding time, I would absolutely tell you as a professional to wake them up and feed them. And then if they need to go right back to bed, do so because that way you're maximizing the intake in the day, right? If you do feedings every three hours, you're looking at typically five feedings in the day. Seven, 10, one, four, and seven, right? You wanna maximize those feedings so that again, through the overnight hours, 
you're minimizing the amount of milk they're gonna need. Remember, 24 to 32 ounces is what a baby needs in the day. Now, what a lot of my new clients will do is for the first eight weeks of life, they'll actually incorporate a dream feed in there. I actually did this with my husband as well. So I was nursing, but we introduced bottles right away. So I would express milk at certain points throughout the day. And then we would keep some milk in the fridge, have some on the counter if I just pumped it before bed, whatever, right? Doesn't matter, breast milk or formula. How we did it and how I encourage clients to do it is say, put the baby down for a bedtime that you ideally want to be their bedtime, right? For many parents, it's somewhere between seven and eight o'clock, okay? So get them down for the night in their room, dark, ready to go to bed. And then you know that typically about three hours, especially for a newborn, they're gonna wake to feed, right? So what we would do is like, we would put my son and my daughter down at seven o'clock. I would then kind of take a shower. I, you know, I had just fed my son, so I'd let some of the milk kind of refill the tanks. Then I would pump and I would power pump for an hour. So I would pump 10 minutes on, 10 minutes off. I'd watch some trashy show on TV. And then after that hour, I would have whatever milk I pumped, put it on the counter, I would go to bed. So I was going to bed somewhere by like nine o'clock. My husband would actually stay awake. We always seem to have our kids in the spring. So he was watching March Madness and uh, he would go in, get my son or daughter out, bring them into the living room, feed them a full bottle. Like, so he would go in and wake them around 10 o'clock, right? Feed them a full bottle, burp them and then back down. And then I was on duty the rest of the night. Now it did two things. One, it took care of the 10 o'clock feeding they were gonna wake up for to eat. And it afforded me the ability to sleep from about eight or 8.30 till about two o'clock when my son would wake up or my daughter, right? So they would go 10 to two and I was getting a nice five, six hour chunk of sleep and I felt moderately human, right? So that was where maximizing your sleep and kind of setting yourself up for those first couple of weeks, it's a little bit of a dumpster fire. We've all been there, right? It's seven, 10, one, four, seven, 10, one, four, right? Like there still may be those couple wakings at night and it's normal until baby's intake grows. It happens quickly, right? Those first couple weeks are a little blurry, I think for everybody that has a baby. But if you try to set yourself up for success by first, making sure you're watching awake windows to avoid overtired. Second, to look at intake, maximizing that throughout the day and then obviously feeding appropriately overnight. And then next, setting them up for success around the skill of sleep, you're gonna build a beautiful sleeper. And what do I mean by that? So babies are born with a blank slate. I believe it means tabula rasa because there's a beach house that I love in Brigantine, New Jersey, where I go on the weekends. And the name of the house is tabula rasa. And I Googled it one time and it said clean slate. So I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Babies are born with a clean slate. And so how a baby learns to fall asleep is how we teach them right? Sleep's a skill foundationally, right? Just like the first time baby's going to pull themselves up or sit up or stand up, they don't just start walking, right? They have to pull themselves up. They're going to stand for two seconds and fall, right? Then they're going to do it again. And then they're going to fall. And then by the end of the week, they're up for like, you know, 15, 20 seconds. Now they're starting to scoot around the coffee table, right? That's a skill set. With sleep from birth, you're building the skill set. Okay, does it mean every nap's gonna be some rock star high five lay baby in the crib and they're gonna fall asleep? No. But if you start from scratch with a very achievable goal of one time a day, putting that baby down awake with the proper awake window and fed and cleaned for one of those naps, they're gonna fall asleep because they're gonna learn that they can and you're gonna set them up for success because they're not gonna need anything. So now they're just sort of chilling in the crib, looking around and then guess what happens? They drift to sleep. And then that happens for the second nap of the day. And then that happens for two or three weeks at a time, right? You're sharpening the skill. They're born as butter knives. Every time they do it, they're sharpening themselves where they end as a steak knife, right? So I wanna pause. I see some questions coming in over here and I wanna take a look. As you have questions, if you're catching this on the replay, let me know, comment. I'm gonna be posting this in a couple different areas because I want as many new parents to get the help as possible. So post your questions in the comments and let me take a look at what Ms. Eva has here. Can you advise on what to do when the eat play feed cycle is under three hours? My baby feeds every three hours, but naps are short. So by the time they wake up, they aren't hungry. It's only been two hours, but they don't feed well if I feed them mid wake window. So basically, um, if they feed every three hours, but the naps are short. So by the time they wake up, up, they aren't hungry. That's okay. Don't feed them till they're hungry. I think what you're saying, Eva, is like, 
following the like wake eat play but if they're only sleeping for a half hour they're not ready to eat when they wake that's okay two things you want to do one focus on just not feeding to sleep right decoupling the feeding to sleep if a baby's going to start to eat and they're going to fall asleep make sure that you're either removing the bottle or popping them off so that you do not build a sleeping association with food okay if baby wakes and let's say they eat at 10 a.m okay and then they take a nap and uh or let's say they excuse me they take a nap at 10 a.m and then they wake at 10 45 and they're not quite ready to eat yet it's really fine just wake up you know change their diaper do some playing and then you're going to notice they're probably going to get hungry right well that hunger is going to come into play where it's now time to go down for the next nap again just not doing it to sleep over the first eight weeks it's a lot happening in a day right out on my website tinytransitions.com forward slash tools and i say that site because there's about a thousand downloadables out there for you one of them is a sample schedule generator in the ebook i'm sharing as well here with everyone there is also going to be sample schedules for each day to help you kind of figure out like how to structure this it's not going to be a perfect science every day baby may fart and wake up at 30 minutes baby may take a three hour nap and you're like well what do i do with this why did that happen i will tell you a couple things long naps unsupported are not normal for newborns let me say that again long naps unsupported are not normal okay so a lot of questions that i get are around newborns and why won't they nap longer if they're in the crib versus in the swing or the car or the stroller right where they take these like marathon epic naps so it's because it's supported sleep it's motion sleep a baby is always going to sleep better with motion sleep okay the problem is motion sleep creates a prop right so the first three months of life, their body clock biologically is not set to consolidate cycles yet. They're sleeping in two stages of sleep. They spend 50% of their time in REM sleep, 50% of their time in non-REM sleep. That is the only time in their life it happens and it's the first three months. Between months three and four, a baby's actual cycles change to, from the two different stages to the traditional cycles that you're gonna have as a parent who uh, sleeps, you know, throughout the night, like eight hours, right? So a baby's rhythms start to mimic that over the night, somewhere between three and four months. Okay. So when you talk about consolidation of naps, it's totally normal that a baby takes a 45 minute nap unsupported. That is biologically appropriate. Now, again, does it mean that they're never going to nap more than 45 minutes? No, it's just not a cause for concern. A lot of parents are concerned about that. And that's not a cause for concern. I was somebody who liked structure in a day. I did not do well with being home as a parent. I was not good not working a thousand hours a week because I frankly love working, right? So for me, like I'm very type A and I didn't like the ability to have no idea what the day was gonna bring. So I set about a schedule for myself that maximized my son Max at the time, what his needs were, right? So I knew that like every day I was gonna walk at this time. I knew he would sleep there. I knew I would be home at this time. He would nap in the crib. I knew I would walk there, he would sleep. So I set myself up with a schedule because that was good for my psyche, right? There's also the component of this around mental health for parents and new moms who are trying to balance all of this in a crazy batshit world, right? So for me, that was good for my psyche. That's not going to be for everybody, right? But that was how like just understanding the expectations around like, yes, it's totally okay to use the stroller. It's good to do a car ride. Not a problem if you want to cuddle with your newborn, you should. Just try to balance that where you're doing, set a goal, right? One nap a day in the crib and do it usually the first nap of the day, I do find to be the easiest when baby's learning, okay? One nap a day in the crib. And you want that to be where they practice going down independently, right? And if they get upset, guess what you do? You pick them up and you walk them around for a minute and you calm them down. And then you try again and you lay them back down and give them a second to settle, right? That's it. They settle peacefully to sleep, right? You've just created the greatest skill set that you're ever gonna have. And every day that you do that, you're gonna practice some days it may work, there may be a day that's off. That's okay. You got a long time, right? Your baby's new. Do it every day, one nap a day, we're going for the crib, right? You'll get there with that consistency and you'll start to build and sharpen that skill set around independent sleep. And then guess what happens? You lay them down at bedtime and they fall asleep. You lay them down for the second nap and they fall asleep, right? Babies just become really good sleepers because they understand how to, right? That's the foundation of it from a skill set standpoint. So hopefully that makes sense. Everybody feeling good? Give me a thumbs up. I know there's lots of you out there watching, so I always appreciate that. And I know it's a ton of information that I'm sharing with you, 
over the course of an hour. So you're probably taking lots of notes. Don't worry. The newborn ebook that I'm going to share with you has a ton of information. So it's all in there, setting you up for success in the long term so you can feel really good about that and making sure that you know you are on the right track with balancing all of this okay the next thing i want to talk about is around the sleep space and making sure it's safe right because there's a couple components to this first where a baby sleeps it could be a box right i know from the hospitals around here in philly they send you home with a box right if you don't have a safe sleep space a box is safe okay a crib a bassinet a pack and play right no padded bumpers no extra blankets, none of that stuff, okay? It's a hazard, okay? When baby is going down in a safe space that's beautiful, make sure it stays that way, okay? The next thing I wanna talk about is about swaddles because a lot of times, you know, they swaddle at the hospital in this pink and white and blue little wrap. The nurses are good at it and then you come home and baby, you go in after the first nap and they're laying there like this. And they break out of it, right? I swear it's nothing that we're doing wrong, right? They just, all of a sudden at like three days old, they learn how to move much more than they did the first two days, okay? I am not someone who's comfortable having a loose blanket in the crib, so I would say when you get home from the hospital, go right to a swaddle. There's a lot of them in the newborn, newborn ebook I'm gonna share that I talk about, okay? And the reason I mention a couple different options is because I want you to visit your, uh, uh, ultrasounds. Sorry, it's been a couple of years. Visit your ultrasounds. If your baby slept for nine months like this in the womb, chances are they don't want to be straight jacketed down in the swaddle. They're going to be annoyed by that. They want their hands up. That's how they spent nine months. So go back and look at the ultrasounds and see if their hands are up. They may do better with something like the, the swaddle up, right? You may have babies that were just the whole time in the crib and they like the tightness or the comfort, right? So getting a swaddle that's Velcro, I love because that Velcro doesn't move, right? I'm not a huge fan of the tying ones because I feel like babies always break out of those. No matter how you do it, they Houdini and you come in in the morning and their hands are like up at their face, right? So get one of the Velcro ones. You can swaddle those hands in nice and tight. Baby will feel real good. There's a lot of different examples in there, right? Swaddles are perfect. Kids startle. They move. They're used to this, to being tightly, you know, in the womb, tightly kind of constricted, right? Swaddles are great. Somewhere around three months, they're probably going to start to fight the swaddle. They may start to want that freedom. And I actually tell clients between eight and 12 weeks, you should get out of the swaddle, especially if their arms are in. And I'll tell you why. Because if they roll and their arms are swaddled down, now you're only relying on their neck to be able to pick them up, right? And babies can roll as early as eight weeks. So you have to be real careful. Watch and make sure that you're kind of following with their cues of what they're doing. Okay, when you talk about Swaddle Transitions products, there's two that I find to be uh, my favorites, right? And there's a lot of products on the market. It's not to say any of them are bad. It's just I work in a space where there's a lot of products. The first product I love is the Magic Merlin Sleep Suit for a variety of reasons. One, keeps you on your back. It's safe. Two, you can access your fingers. Babies like to suck. It's a coping mechanism, right? There's a, their ability to get your hands even in this giant marshmallow, and they're able to settle and suck on their fingers. Three, it provides them the ability to still move around the crib. Babies are gonna find a spot in that crib where they're comfortable, and that suit still affords them to stay on their back, but also allow them to shuffle over to the corner of the crib where they find comfort. They can stay there. Don't move them back to the center. We all do it as parents. We set kids down right in the middle of the crib, and they spend 20 minutes wiggling over to the side. If they're gonna spend 20 minutes wiggling there, throw them a bone and put them there at bedtime, okay? Because they're just gonna spend 20 minutes and a lot of energy trying to get there, okay? The Merlin I like because it still lets them wiggle, but it also keeps them on their back and they're safe and they can still find the comfy spot. The startle reflex, right? That's very strong. Babies will startle themselves to sleep and wake and every nap and every overnight that startle is calmed in the Merlin, right? So that's why I like the Merlin. Now, flip side of that, you have a baby that flips on their belly. All of a sudden at three months, they're flipping on their belly. Doctor says it's fine, you know, and you have them in something like a wearable blanket, but the startle's still strong right? Or maybe baby's not flipping, but every once in a while you're coming in the morning and they're on their belly, right? So they start out on their night on the back and then they flip over to their belly, right? The, the Zippity is another product that I love that um, allows, you know, them to sleep on their belly and then their hands are still kind of constricted in like the startle aspect, right? So they're in a giant pouch. I call it the flying squirrel, um, but they're in kind of this big sack, but it protects the startle, still affords the comfort of swaddling, 
you know, and there's different products out there. You want to make sure you read all the guidelines and the instructions around which one you buy, because I don't want to just generically name something. And then you're like, you said to buy this one and they, they were on their belly. Like you got to do your homework, read the instructions, follow the instructions. Right. But basically those are my two kind of favorites because they, they one protect that startle, but also provide that freedom of mobility and still protect against, you know, the certain things based on the habits that they're going to have that still makes it safe sleep. Okay, so again, take a look at the ultrasound and figure out what position your little one was comfortable in because again, they spend nine months here, they're not going to want to be like this, right? And then somewhere between eight and 12 weeks, you look to get out of that swaddle as sleep starts to regulate. Babies are usually around eight weeks going roughly about eight hours before they're waking for a feeding, okay? You want that to be consolidated, restorative, independent sleep, okay? So we're going to talk about overnights and what that looks like next because restorative independent sleep, right? We hear the news, we see the articles, I'm in Facebook groups with like so many parents that struggle, they're on the struggle bus with sleep and I try so hard to put so much information out there. I do this web shop, webinar, I do another one in a couple weeks called the Save Your Sanity Making Over Bedtime Sleep Workshop where it's a five day series actually on sleep around kids that are kind of over three months of age, so out of the newborn phase. And I try to put so much information out there because so many parents struggle with sleep and understanding like what's a want, what's a need, when should they sleep through the night, how do I know if it's habit versus hunger, right? When you start from where you are now, with building solid sleep foundation, your baby's gonna sleep, right? What starts to happen is that dreaded four month sleep regression, right? And there are developmental things that are happening around four months of age that can cause regressions, right? Their baby's whole new world is changing. They're going from stages to cycles of sleep. The REM sleep starts to change as far as the total amount. They're able to actually see and interact and engage more, right? For a lot of parents, they're going back to work. Baby may be starting daycare, totally different level of exertion there, right? And all of a sudden, sleep struggles. And frankly, for some parents, it's just that, hey, you know what, for the first 12 weeks, we're gonna do whatever. And then at 12 weeks, I want baby to sleep magically. You're not just gonna lay them down in the crib for the first time awake and expect they know how to go to sleep, right? It's a skill set. Like the only way they ever fell asleep was rocking, nursing, bouncing, feeding, driving, whatever. That's what they expect to go to sleep, right? So you've gotta show and empower them that they actually possess this skill to do it. Oh, and by the way, you gotta do it as gently as possible, right? We don't want hours and hours of tears. Nobody wants that, right? And what I don't teach is like stick baby in the crib, let them cry all night, right? That's not what I do. That's not what this is about. It's about setting good foundations in sleep hygiene, sleep habits, and the fact that sleep, frankly, is a skill that you're teaching, okay? So when you talk about bedtime and we talk about overnight management, you've got to balance one intake. How do they eat today, right? If, they, if you're bottle feeding or you're exclusively pumping, you can track ounces and you can know 24 to 32 ounces, where do they fall in the range? If they're on the lower end, okay, may need a one or two feeding night. If they're at like 36 ounces, they're good, right? So that way you know, like, okay, that waking is probably a habit-based waking. They're looking for something else to go to sleep, right? You wanna always be cognizant of those things and trying your best to minimize in the middle of the night. When they wake to feed, you go to them, you pick them up, you feed them, you burp them, lay them back down as many times as you can awake right? And let them settle back to sleep. Sometimes they are going to fall asleep. Their baby is at three in the morning and they're tired, right? That's okay. You don't do anything to wake them up. I've had clients that are like, well, I, you know, I threw some washcloth warm water on them to wake them up. I'm like, what? They're sleeping. It's three in the morning. Like it's going to happen. It's okay. Right? Like just following the cues and what they're doing in the middle of the night, right? If there's discomfort, gas, reflux, colic, right? Look at your feeding schedule. Try to make sure that you're balancing full feeds every three hours, because I do see that even overnight, that does help with balancing, you know, the indigestion that sort of happens as the, again, a result of filling the tank too much. There's nowhere for that milk to go but up, okay? So in the middle of the night, sometimes you have to hold them for 30 minutes to keep them upright. That's okay. Try your best to kind of keep them upright and not let them fall asleep. It's going to happen, right? They're little humans. There is a balance to all of what I'm teaching you, but if you take the core principles of what I'm teaching you here today and you implement it in your day, you're gonna set yourself up with a baby who sleeps well, okay? And the newborn ebook is gonna help you with that. So there's lots of good stuff to come in there because it's a lot of information, everything of which I'm covering here. I took a couple weeks and I wrote it all down and I'm giving it to you today, okay? No charge. 
just for showing up because sleep's a skill and you can set a good foundation right from the start. Okay. Again, you may never need me and that's wonderful, but if you do, I'm always going to be here and I'm always going to be happy to help with it. Okay. So how do I start with overnight and what this should look like? First, keep your phone out of the room. This has blue light. These glasses are blue light blocking glasses. I am on my computer from five o'clock in the morning until five o'clock at night when I stop working. I take a small two hour break to get my kids off to summer camp and to hang with them for a bit. And then when they're gone, I work. I'm in my office all day on the computer, right? These are blue light blockers because blue light's a stimulant. Same thing comes off your phone. When you're sitting there at three in the morning and you're on Instagram and I see it because I get a bazillion leads on my website every single night of people that are like, I'm tired, it's three in the morning. I see what time they come in, right? That's a stimulant for you. So if you're gonna do it, make sure your blue light is turned off. There's something called night switch on the iPhone or like night shift. I use blue light blocking glasses. My brother is like totally on his phone all the time. So for his birthday, I got him non-prescription blue light blocking glasses. Cause I'm like, dude, this is killing your sleep. He bitches that he doesn't sleep well because he's on his phone all the time. Like keep your phone out of the bedroom and put these on when you're on it so that it doesn't stimulate you. Blue light's a stimulant, right? Same thing with mobiles. A lot of people used to use mobiles. They think like they're soothing and calming and super cute on the crib. Think about what it is. It's a stimulant light with blue light that's circling and playing music. Not at all conducive to sleep, right? Also pay attention to the lights that are in the room. So many of you have a monitor, you may have an outlet, there may be a hatch, there may be all kinds of different things going on. There's these tiny little lights that are on all those devices, cover them with tape and turn off the night light in your baby's room. They do not need it, they're not scared of the dark. Babies sleep better in darkness. Bat cave, I'm talking bat cave, okay? If you ever need questions or help around like what type of curtains to buy or whatever, let me know because it is super important to conducive good overnight sleep, right? Sun starts to rise early. You don't want baby getting up at 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. thinking it's time to start the day. The next is give babies a few minutes. The second you hear them, don't run to them. Now I'm not saying you ignore a newborn. That's not what I'm saying. I'm also just saying like, sometimes they're loud, right? When babies are in active sleep, they're loud. They're moving and they're talking and they're sleeping, right? So if they're in your room and you're hearing them at three in the morning go, oh, they're potentially still sleeping. So give them a minute because they may just fall into another cycle and go back to sleep. Okay. So let me know if you have any questions so far, just pop it in over there. Um, make sure you get a good burp out. Sometimes that can be uncomfortable. Middle of the night, sometimes it's hard because they fall back to sleep. Try some different methods around burping. Uh, you know, doing the, I used to do the neck hold where it was like, you, you kind of, it's hard to show on the camera where. I don't have a doll in here with my daughters, but you like lean forward and kind of support the neck. It always scared me to do this initially, but like you lean forward and kind of support them here. The pressure helps with the belly and then they get a nice burp out. Okay. So making sure that that's happening. Your melatonin in babies starts to regulate somewhere between eight and 12 weeks. So a body's natural rhythm sometime around four months is also part of what's changing, right? The first couple of weeks of life, they're not creating that yet, right? Their body is just regulating. That's that 50% of REM. 50% of non-REM sleep, okay? So I wanna take a minute and kind of recap a lot of the different action items I shared with you and really where you should begin. First, start by giving yourself some grace. Motherhood, parenthood is hard, right? It's hard to not feel overwhelmed. It's hard to not feel like, what the hell am I doing today? This is a dumpster fire. Give yourself grace, okay? I can tell you from personal experience, give yourself grace. Second thing you do, is first nap of the day, try it in the crib, try it tomorrow. Watch your awake windows and start to track them in the sleep log that's gonna be in the newborn ebook, okay? Start to pay attention to your awake windows, also in the ebook, okay? Making sure that you're setting your little one up for success, watching their cues, making sure you're setting them up at the right time and making sure you're doing full feedings. Those are gonna be the best things that I can tell you from start, the day they come home from the hospital, that you are able to actually do to create good sleep habits in your little one, okay? Again, between eight and 12 weeks is when you can ex start to expect longer stretches are happening. At eight weeks, around eight hours, nine weeks, around nine hours. Again, they're humans, not robots, so there is a bit of variability in this, um, but it's really paying attention to that, right? And making sure that you're setting them up and setting yourself up for success in both the daytime and the overnight. Sleep begets sleep. Avoid overtired, watch those awake windows, and make sure you jump out here in my Facebook group, Slumber Made Simple. Every single week on Thursdays, 
I do a live q and I hop on camera and I answer all your sleep questions. Doesn't matter the age, you don't have to be a client. It's really meant to be a community. I'm trying to build a sense of community, okay? I want you to have a resource to go to because when I had my son, there was nothing. I felt alone and I felt like I wanted to drive my car off a bridge, which is why I took a total 180 on my career. I had my master's in marketing. I had a great high level marketing job for a Fortune 500 company and I quit and I went back to school and I became certified in lactation. I became a sleep professional. I got my postpartum doula because I basically realized that there was no help for parents. And I came home making sure baby was strapped in properly at the hospital. And that was the amount of help I got when I got home from the hospital. So making sure that you come out here and use me, use my team. I have a, a great team of sleep consultants and professionals. They all vary in background, skill sets, knowledge, experience, right? So there's a lot of folks here between myself and my team that as a community are more than happy to help you take advantage of it, okay? Join us each week. I do trainings all the time. I've got one popping in here at three o'clock today. So there's lots of different stuff that I'm always trying to do. I pop in live randomly. I'm here to support you, to service you. I'm gonna share the newborn ebook. You know, most people charge you like $79 for their ebook, right? I'm giving it to you. It's probably worth a lot more. Definitely a lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into it. So I'm gonna share that with you here. Any questions that you have, please do let me know. I am here for you. Again, comment here, join me out in the community. If you ever interested in just saying, you know what, Courtney, like I just wanna get started on this now and I need help. I do work with newborns. I do private consultations with clients. I have consults that are you know, lasting up to 16 weeks with a new mom that just got home from the hospital and wants hand holding that whole way. I have clients that just wanna have a phone call with me and let's chat through what's going on, right? And then I have clients where they're somewhere in the middle around eight to 12 weeks. Maybe they're getting ready to go back to work. They have no idea what the future holds and they wanna make sure that they're setting their little one up. Or frankly, sleep could be a mess. You could be catching this right now at eight weeks and go, I'm a dumpster fire, I need help, reach out, okay? I'll share my link here. I offer sleep evaluations at no charge. We'll spend 30 minutes on the phone, let's get acquainted. I wanna make sure you like me, I like you and you like uh, what I'm doing, okay? So I am here, always happy to help. Again, my name's Courtney Zentz. Thank you so much for joining. I love doing these workshops. Appreciate you coming in and I do look forward to seeing you out in the group around the world. And uh, thank you again for joining. Have a beautiful rest of the day. Bye for now.